this webinar is being recorded as of now. We are going to hear from Dane County. Dane County, uh, Wisconsin has done some really wonderful things as it relates to centering equity. And specifically, we will hear from uh, the program manager, C Colleen Clark Bernhardt, and she is the manager of policy and practice innovations for Dane County, Wisconsin Board of Supervisors. Colleen also coordinates the Dane County Criminal Justice uh, Council, and in these roles, she serves as a catalyst for innovation in criminal justice reform and equity throughout county operations. Uh, Ms. Uh, Clark Bernhardt is also the past co-leader of the racial equity and social justice team within Dane County and has also served as a liaison to the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. Dane County, um, it would be helpful to know, that has been developing strategies to improve their racial equity and criminal justice in county policy since 2008. And Ms. Clark Bernhardt has been in, an integral part uh, to this policy research, as well as uh, strategic partnerships and engagement in this area. So without further ado, Colleen, take it over. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Lisa and PRI and, and um, MacArthur for inviting me to speak a little bit about um, Dane County. Um, I sit uh, where I'm sitting today is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk people um, and Dane County, Wisconsin, um, is the home of the city of Madison, which is the state capital of Wisconsin. If you think back on fourth grade um, state capitals, I'll give you um, really brief some data about the state of Wisconsin. The demographics generally for the state are about 83% white, uh, approximately 6% African American or black, uh, with a growing Latinx population. Um, especially for Dane County. Um, for some of you, if you saw the sentencing project um, from 2021, you will note that uh, Wisconsin had the dubious articulation of being the worst in racial disparities for prison admission rate, um, black to white racial disparity gap. If we look specifically to Dane County and our jail, uh, Dane County does a great job at um, having a lower incarceration rate than most jurisdictions around the country. We're very proud of that and it took a lot of movement between stakeholders and community to get that lower incarceration rate. However, what you'll hear today and some of the lessons we learned is you needed to take a deeper look at that. When we look more deeply, we see that our arrest rate um, our arrest disparity gap, depending on how you measure the data, is anywhere between eight to one, up to 11 to one, black to white. So clearly we have a lot of work to do. So I'd like to give a little of where we've been, where we are and where we hope to be. Next slide, please. So starting as Lisa mentioned, back in 2008, we really started doing some work after the community um, got together a report called the State of Black Madison in 2008. Then we created a coalition task force, which was made up of elective uh, stakeholders, folks with lived experience in criminal justice, advocates, other stakeholders and staff um, to work over a year and a half on creating recommendations to try to lower the racial disparities that we had in Dane County. Um, that continued as we moved, um, and you'll hear a little bit about our most successful project, but starting in 2014, that momentum kept going, um, and we did actually a racial equity analysis of all county operations. So clearly, clearly we know structural and systemic racism doesn't start and end with criminal justice, but it's the synergy and it's the overlap between everything governments can do. In Dane County's case, we do everything from A to Z, airport to zoo. So the racial equity analysis was really of all county operations. Next slide, please. 
County Executive Joe Parisi and past uh, County Board Chair Sharon Corrigan um, started the Racial Equity and Social Justice Initiative in 2014 after that um, landmark report, really um, focusing on uh, making Dane County a place, not just that, um, you know, national, national magazines and, and reports say best place to live, but for all residents to have uh, the ability to thrive, um, including in criminal justice. Next slide, please. So how do we operationalize these big values into everyday practice? Um, one of the early things we did was for all um, agendas, not just the Dane County Criminal Justice Council, which I should say is made up of uh, 13 of those executive level decision makers. Uh, but we have four questions in front of every standing committee and every meeting agenda. They are who benefits, who is burdened, who does not have a voice at the table, and how can policymakers mitigate unintended consequences? Those should be considerations at every meeting, at every policy, and every budget. Additionally, we have annual presentations, uh, just like most governments, in front of your legislative body or your executive body, where each, each department director needs to articulate as a part of their annual budget what they have done to improve racial equity in their space. Is it access to parks? Is, is it, um, is it uh, adding a more diverse staff? Those are always articulated annually and they are published um, for our public through the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the CJC Criminal Justice Council has had a long history of trying to address racial inequities. It's impossible to erase the last 100, 400 years of uh, US government practices, um, but we've been trying for about 15 now to, to make things better in Dane County. I'll give you a few highlights on um, some of the things we've done. This is all available on our website, cjc.countyofdane.com. Um, as I mentioned, the 20, 2009 uh, report had a ton of recommendations. One, which was to create a restorative justice option. And so you'll hear more about um, what we did create, the Dane County uh, community restorative court in a little bit. Um, but through all these reports, the engagement to the community, um, going back to partners who have had lived experience, finding new partnerships has been part of our vision of moving things forward. Next slide, please. So uh, this picture is what, what I um, talk about when I talk about the Dane County Criminal Justice Council and criminal justice in general. Um, mo many folks will say criminal justice is like a series of windowless huts. Um, law enforcement is unlikely to know what the judges are doing. Public defenders will maybe not know what reentry is doing. So in Dane County, the Dane County Criminal Justice Council, which is made up of the executive level decision makers, including the city of Madison and certainly in Dane County, um, including the sheriff, the district attorney, the county executive, chief judge, uh, county board chair and county exec meet monthly to collaborate in order to try to open up some windows between those huts and have better communication. Um, we have three subcommittees. Uh, the one that I'll focus on a little today is uh, the longest standing subcommittee, which is the Subcommittee on Racial Disparities in Criminal Justice. That's chaired by our district attorney, Ishmael Ozan, Judge Mario White, and supervisor, now state representative, Sheila Stubbs. Uh, that committee and those folks have been champions on really um, approaching change from root cause. Uh, we have a data sharing agreement 
with those data owners in criminal justice. So we can try to connect the dots. Uh, Wisconsin does not have a unique identifier for all folks. So Colleen could get arrested in Sun Prairie, booked in jail, and there's no way to connect the dots. Now we've got a way to connect the dots through the data sharing MOU. We've expanded our um, thanks to one of our community stakeholder groups that said, you know what, Dane County, um, you need to be able to measure what you're doing before you try to manage it. And we did not have that ability to connect the dots. So the Dane County Board put in a CJC research analyst um, and we've added to that capacity. So we're able to partner with folks like Harvard's Access to Justice Lab and MDRC and Kids Forward, moving things forward, as well as partnering with community groups um, to try to get the community lens with accurate data to move things forward. Next slide, please. So as we move things forward, we try to frame the issue with data and collaboration. So when I talk about the Dane County Community Restorative Court, it's a restorative justice option for 17 to 26 year old misdemeanors. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, state issued misdemeanors uh, are on a public website for case management. It's called CCAP. So the collateral consequences of something, a disorderly conduct or something else you may do as a young adult are longstanding. They affect housing, employment, and more. Um, so we did a deep dive on just where the racial inequity was the largest in misdemeanors. We gathered City of Madison and some of the folks on the screen, City of Madison um, staff, county, and community leaders, and we learned together. We, we took a trip thanks to a small grant we got to New York City and leaned in and learned together. One thing I'll mention is that um, many, we had many um, great opportunities to learn, and we had some great opportunities to have dinners and have arguments. And you may think arguments are between systems folks and the community folks at the table and that happened. But what also happened was some old wounds between city of Madison in this case and Dane County came, to, came up and we were able to heal that and move on and develop real partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there we go. So what is the Dane County Community Restorative Court? Again, it's that restorative justice, non-traditional approach. There's no judge involved to repair harm, reduce risk, and rebuild community. There are wraparound supports available for, um, we don't call them offenders, we call the, the individuals involved in the CRC respondents. There's wraparound supports, including behavioral health, uh, including help with restoration. And I must say, when we talk about an active community, a community that wants to make a difference in the criminal justice system, we need to look no further than the example of the folks at the Dane County Community Restorative Court. They have over 300 community individuals who are peacemakers, who sit in circle, help the respondent craft a a harm reduction, an agreement, um, a restorative justice agreement. The success rate is well over 85%. And because we took time and actually framed this with data with a racial equity lens, I'm happy to say, unlike many alternatives that are developed, this option does see a majority of people of color. Uh, next slide, please. So we started slow. Um, but we've had long-term progress. It's developed so it's available throughout the county. Uh, that's largely in part to the gentleman. You'll see the second from the left. Uh, that is our first Dane County uh, Community Restorative Court Coordinator, Ron Johnson, who unfortunately has recently passed. His efforts and his um, knowledge really set the grounding for an extremely successful uh, criminal justice alternative. Next slide. 
So what are we doing now? How do we keep um, racial equity centered? I put up some verbiage and I can read it um, from one of our recent RFPs or requests for a proposal. This was for a um, gap analysis of our behavioral health system, looking at a potential triage center. Community demand for alternatives to criminal justice intervention is greater than ever. There's a great deal of interest among the citizens of Dane County to develop alternative approaches, um, but also ensuring the most affected by inequity have a meaningful voice in the design, planning, implementation, and evaluation of proposed solutions. This means whoever applied for this RFP needed to have a very strong community engagement plan. So again, centering on racial equity and public engagement, developing those partnerships early before the plan is completely hatched and finding elected champions as well as community champions. Next slide, please. So when we look at the future, we're thinking of um, developing, we are going to develop a community justice center. We did a pre-engagement, which was contracting with nonprofits, um, community nonprofits that are led by people of color to speak with their own clientele about this is an idea. This is not a fully hatched um, something to edit. I'd like to just spend, it's just a couple minutes um, to hear what our community says about criminal justice. So in general, the response we got um, from community members were very positive with this idea of a community justice center. Um, a lot of community members felt that this could be um, a, a pivotal and critical piece added to our community to uh, support those who are truly in need. If this model is embraced and embraced fully, that it would could be a really positive thing, but they're really skeptical that it will be fully embraced. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in the justice system and how things have already been working. And so they're not, they're very skeptical about how this will be different from what we already have going on in Madison or in Dane County, sorry. And so they, um, so they were saying, how do we make it different? How does the face different and how do we actually create like a separation between the uh, courts and the center um, so so people can feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, unfortunately, many lack trust of the current justice system that we have. Um, a lot of them don't have faith in it. There's a lack of rapport. Another uh, theme that was across the board for a lot of the participants in our focus group was um, discrimination or racism and how that oftentimes makes them feel dehumanized by the process or the system. And there was a lot of conversation about what that experience is in ways that the system could support them. They would, they would feel that this would be a way of humanizing and supporting immigrant communities. It's critical that we have all stakeholders on board for this. And someone with lived experience said, everybody's gotta be on the same page. Everyone involved has to be willing to go forward significant effort and just being sensitive to different needs for different people. And so many of them wanted to see, could there be educational um, services at the center to really educate folks about the process and about a person's legal rights. Everyone felt that um, in addition to um, those cultural differences, if there are more Southeast Asians in leadership roles in the legal system, that might help reduce some of those uh, fears and distrust. Um, in, the, in the legal system. I think one of the themes that grows across the board in addition to the need for um, accessibility both linguistically and culturally for um, immigrant communities is also the ability to share information about what the criminal system looks like, what are the agencies that compose that, and, um, and what are the ways to better access the system. Um, People felt this can be a good collaboration between UW, Madison College. It can allow uh, folks to get their GED, um, address the ALDA issues, um, address their mental health, um, uh, uh, shelter, food. But overall, um, folks like the idea of the social justice center um, so much that even some of the Hmong youth 
uh, wanted to volunteer to be part of the youth court. So it's a lot of people, they're open to it and they're looking forward to it. They just really want to make sure that it's done correctly the first time. This uh, community justice center could, can, and can be the, the hub, I should say, of a lot of opportunities and resources for our community um, who are in need. And, and this would in, indeed change the mindset because this isn't a, a policy thing or a behavior thing. It's really a hard thing when it comes to a lot of um, the feelings and, and the impressions that individuals have for our community or the criminal justice center. So. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So what's the key to changing the disparity gap? I know 15 years ago, I asked a number of national people this. There is no one key. There's not a checklist. There's not something that you can do to make everything go away. But next slide, please. I do have some ideas to moving racial equity forward. There are no easy answers. But framing with data and trying to get as accurate data that, as you can that stakeholders agree on, as well as the community and what the community is experiencing. Again, engaging communities most impacted, not at the end of the process, but very early. What you just heard was a pre-engagement. Find your elected champions. Build collaborative partnerships and unique partnerships. Learn together. Get ready for those hard conversations and hurt feelings. But as long as you've built a partnership with respect um, and authenticity, um, folks will come back to the table. And remember the greater purpose and long-term goals. I can't say it any better than um, Mr. Williams did. Not a, this is not a program, it's not a policy, it's really a heart thing. And so lead with your values. Next slide. And thank you. And I, I, there's my email. Thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to answer questions later. Hey, thank you so much, Colleen. That was wonderful. And thank you for sharing with us about Ding and its pursuit of racial equity in your criminal justice system and showing us that for people in Dane County to have fair and just opportunities in, in your criminal justice system that you've laid out to us that it can't happen without confronting and addressing the obstacles that make it more difficult for certain groups and individuals just because of their race. So thank you for your transparency. Any questions? There aren't any questions right now for Dane County. Uh, feel free everyone to please put them in the chat box and we'll give time at the end of the presentation to come back to any presenters that we need to. But next, we're going to hear from um, New Orleans, NOLA, less than two weeks out of Mardi Gras. Um, and you will be hearing from Kate Hoadley, who is the Racial Justice Program Manager from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Coordination in the City of New Orleans. In Kate's role, she manages the Ethnic and Racial Disparity Working Group through the Safety and Justice Challenge Network and the office's Racial Equity Initiatives. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to PRA and MacArthur for allowing me and to New Orleans to add to the conversation today. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Kate Holdley with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Coordination, and as Racial Equity Program Manager, I collaborate with our Safety and Justice Challenge team on our criminal legal system reform initiatives uh, to embed a racial justice lens into our work. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, to frame the work that we are currently doing around racial equity and criminal legal system reform, I wanted to provide a little bit of background. Um, when the city of New Orleans joined the Safety and Justice Challenge in 2015, the city incarcerated nearly twice as many people each year as the national average and had a jail population of over 1,500 people. Um, in 2016, the Office of Criminal Justice Coordination designed a 17-point plan, which evolved into 11 initiatives that were implemented in 2018. Um, just as a snapshot, these initiatives included increasing summons in lieu of arrest, 
launching a harm reduction pre-booking program that provided a broad range of services and referrals to folks who would otherwise be arrested for reasons related to substance use, mental illness, or trauma, um, as well as establishing an access to defense counsel program um, to provide folks with advocacy at first appearance to ensure that folks were not being detained because of inability to pay, as well as improving our pretrial services program to allow our courts to make decisions to release folks um, from jail who were awaiting trial without putting um, public safety at risk, as well as including um, an expanded use of lease on our own recognizance. Um, we also expanded our community engagement by establishing a community advisory group, which consists of 28 community members who are committed to holding criminal justice agencies accountable and um, ensuring that safety and justice challenge initiatives incorporated um, the community and centered community at the forefront of planning, design, as well as implementation and evaluation. Um, in addition to a uh, court system reminder program um, to notify folks of either upcoming or recently missed court dates to reduce failure to appears in our criminal legal system here. Um, these initiatives were absolutely instrumental in significantly decreasing our local jail population um, in addition to community support, um, but they also illuminated a need to dive deeper into the root causes of criminal legal system involvement, um, such as structural racism outside and within the criminal criminal legal system. Um, and as we saw, and as I think, um, you know, other folks have alluded to on the call, that disparities have really persisted and in some cases increased um, since the start of us joining the Safety and Justice Challenge. Next slide, please. Um, our first implementation period really stressed that re in reducing over-incarceration, we must move beyond the criminal legal system and that we need to have a holistic approach to reduce community harm, increase public safety, and break the cycles of trauma and incarceration and reincarceration. Um, as such, our sort of second iteration of the Safety and Justice Challenge initiatives, we really focused on expanding and addressing root causes of incarceration, namely addressing the intersection of behavioral health and the criminal legal system. Um, some of these initiatives included our law enforcement assisted diversion program, which is a harm reduction public health approach to policing for those who are criminalized for underlying and unmet behavioral health needs. Um, as I mentioned, LEAD follows a harm reduction framework, which allows police officers to divert individuals into truly intensive on the ground, meeting folks where they are, case management at the point of arrest. Um, we also instituted and expanded our pretrial services program, which provides also intensive case management for individuals who are released pretrial, as well as um, in coordination with pretrial services, implementing a community supported release program, which was operated by a community based organization um, to help folks overcome barriers that they may have um, in attending court. Um, including access to social services, um, including even food insecurity. Um, we also implemented a prosecutorial diversion program um, with our new district attorney who was elected in 2020. Um, we have been able to expand to plea pre-diversion, um, which the intent is to hold individuals accountable through supportive programming versus um, kind of a punitive approach to accountability through the criminal legal system. Um, really, this diversion program is designed to reduce recidivism through addressing root causes of criminal legal system involvement, which will include services such as counseling, education, substance use treatment, and mental health services. Um, and then our final program, which I really want to highlight here, is our jail release navigator position, which is designed to provide transition planning services to help reduce rates of recidivism among incarcerated individuals who are dealing with mental health and substance use issues. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, one of the reasons we wanted to highlight the jail navigator position is because PRA was absolutely instrumental um, in getting this program up and running as well as design. Um, and I think it's a really powerful lens to look at successful programs that address the intersection of racial inequities, behavioral health, in the criminal legal system, um, both in New Orleans and also nationally, um, especially I think among you know circles such as these, there's been an increase in narrative surrounding community harm um, and where the criminal legal system fits into that. Um, we know that community harm and criminal legal system involvement um, both intersect with both trauma, behavioral health, and, and structural racism. Um, and we also know that due to policy violence and historical disinvestment, that areas that are majority Black, Indigenous, people of color are less likely to have supportive services. And that because of that, you know, untreated behavioral health issues often lead to criminal legal system involvement um, and typically frequent interactions with the local criminal legal system here. Um, and our jail release navigator position really targets these individuals who have been just continually disinvested in and meets them where they are um, with intensive care. The, our jail release navigators in New Orleans typically coordinate with community-based um, service providers, housing providers, um, our pretrial services program, as well as probation programs to make sure that that continuum of criminal legal system actors are all on the same page and that the criminal legal system is not exacerbating harm for these individuals, as well as um, services outside the criminal legal system, such as crisis services, um, hospitals, and other service providers as needed. Um, Really, I think this position just highlights um, that in order to address the root causes of recidivism um, and give individuals the care and support that they need, um, we really need to bridge gaps um, and connect them to continuums of care, um, which this position does. Um, also, I think interestingly about this program is that we have developed a sort of innovative new dashboard, um, which identifies eligibility for enrollment for the program, um, therefore ensuring that enrollment is standardized and also can be tracked um, to ensure equity. Um, and then also beyond the safety and justice challenge, the jail release navigator position will be sustained through our medical provider and our local jail um, as we've implemented um, the jail release navigator position as a component of an RFP that was recently issued to identify a medical provider. Um, and so I think it shows, you know, the importance importance of um, and the ability to sustain these um, really important investments beyond the safety and justice challenge. Next slide, please. Um, the other strategic shift that um, Bria talked about a lot is that ensuring that we are approaching this work um, through embedding a racial equity lens. The left chart shows our local jail population, which since the start of the safety and justice challenge has decreased by 46%. Um, and the right chart shows what's called a relative rate index, which is a metric that we use a lot as it's kind of a helpful way to compare experiences across different groups. Um, specifically, the relative rate index calculation specifically examines the rate that Black individuals are, representative, are represented in the jail population relative to the population in Orleans Parish um, in comparison to the rate that white individuals are represented in the jail, again, relative to the Orleans Parish population. Um, in 2021, we saw that the relative rate index is four and a half, which translates to black people in comparison to white people in Orleans Parish being five times more likely to be at jail, uh, in jail at any given point. Um, and again, that measure is controlling for population, which I think just illustrates and shows the work that really needs to be intentional work that needs to be done around racial equity and criminal legal system um, reform. And so um, next slide, please. And so to address this, we followed um, the MacArthur guidance to establish a ethnic and racial disparity working group. Um, and in establishing the membership for the working group, we focused on ensuring that all points of the criminal legal system were represented 
were represented so that we have the ability to address disparities at each point in the system. Um, in terms of community voice, we really wanted to uplift community and ensure that there was adequate representation. Um, thus, we had a equal number, number of government, but also community representatives. Um, this is to really ensure that we have authentic power sharing um, and decision making between community and government and that we can work in collaboration. Um, also to sort of illustrate um, and ensure equitable power sharing, we are we established the group in partnership with the Vera Institute of Justice um, in New Orleans, which has been a longstanding partner with the city of New Orleans in our safety and justice challenge work. Um, written here is a vision statement from the working group, which was designed and approved by all 34 members of the group. Um, a few things I won't necessarily read it, but to note is that I think it's really important that the work that we are doing really focuses on decarceration and also names the importance of addressing structural racism without outside of the criminal legal system. And like Bria was mentioning earlier, um, that we need to be also intersectional when we're thinking about equity. And um, as we're making policy decisions, you know, we need to ensure that um, we are being intentional about intersection equity as we kind of move through decisions about policies and practices to increase racial equity. Um, next slide, please. So here's a timeline of about the first nine months of our working group. Um, I won't necessarily go through these, but some of the lessons that I learned and that we learned over the last nine months or those nine months were that it is a very delicate balance between having unstructured space um, for discussion and also, you know, ensuring that we are working towards specific and measurable goals um, to increase equity. Um, for example, during the first few months of the working group, uh, we gathered inputs from members on how to advance racial equity, but we really struggled to get input from all members because we really had not built that foundation of trust um, and authentic engagement, um, as well as just having this unstructured approach didn't necessarily um, you know, work without cultivating that trust. Um, as such, we held a retreat. Um, it was six hours over two days for the group, which really centered um, creating values and norms for the group. Um, this was facilitated by the Burns Institute, which is another technical assistance provider in the Safety and Justice Challenge, as well as really providing sort of a structured space for folks to understand where we had been with the Safety and Justice Challenge and getting folks on the same page about um, you know, where we have been in terms of criminal legal system reform, but then also where we were in terms of racial equity beyond the criminal legal system and getting that sort of landscape in New Orleans um, so that folks could be approaching the work on the same page. And then through that, we held a um, strategic priority session where folks really got to um, shape the scope of our first recommendation report, as well as um, create that vision statement that I um, showed earlier. Next slide, please. Um, and so over those nine months, uh, we were working towards developing a recommendation report, which through our strategic priority session, we came up with providing two types of recommendations. Um, one being to center racial equity within our current criminal legal system reforms. Um, this was, I think, central to our work to say, you know, we're being fully transparent and we need to do better on terms of centering equity within the work that we are doing and also really creating a blueprint for criminal legal system reform initiatives moving forward to kind of lean on to say these are the types of um, considerations that we need to have to center racial equity. Um, we chose our law enforcement assisted diversion program and prosecutorial diversion program to really um, provide recommendations specific to those programs to center racial equity. And then sort of the third component of the report was to say, what is the other key piece or pieces that we are missing within our racial justice work, um, which our working group identified as really we need to kind of move beyond the criminal legal system. And like the foundation is doing Doing support and also fund in a very intentional, authentic way um, our community-based organizations who are really 
doing the work, um, who are serving, you know, folks who are overrepresented in our criminal legal system, um, in particular, our Black communities in New Orleans. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we are, you know, really, really proud of the work that the working group has accomplished. Um, but through facilitating the group, we recognize that we really need to kind of go beyond this structure that is also just an inherently government space um, by being a working group uh, facilitated by our office. Um, and as such, over the next two years, we are working with our community partner, Total Community Action, to create and implement a blueprint for racial justice and reimagined criminal legal system reform. And throughout this process, um, really the city and TCA are community partner are looking to build authentic relationships with both leaders, but also potential leaders, um, as well as just really create an authentic community space for community members to connect, raise concerns, act in their own interest, um, and support community members in generating their own ideas, um, and also recognizing community assets and really uplifting that with both support by government actors, but also in a really intentional way um, with funding as well. Um, next slide, please. And so just some of the sort of underlying assumptions um, that we have in terms of our blueprint and values that we are looking to kind of move forward is that at a structural level, we are utilizing a structural well-being approach, um, which moves beyond dismantling policies and practices that perpetuate disparate outcomes, but really center um, reimagining programs and cross-sector collaboration to create, um, you know, community-centered solutions that really center um, well-being, as well as ensuring that we are prioritizing relationships. Um, again, building off of the work that we've done with the Ethnic and Racial Disparity Working Group, ensuring that we are supporting folks in intentional ways to convene community, to create um, community-based solutions, and then really ensuring that like third piece of systems change and that um, we are working towards just narrative change and changing minds and hearts, you know, as well as policies and practices. Um, and then just sort of in addition to using a systems, um, you know, level approach, we had some sort of key, and these are a few of the sort of underlying assumptions that we had to this approach, which means, you know, those closest um, to the problem are those closest to the solution and ensuring that we as government actors really and truly are empowering those who are overrepresented and who are most impacted by the criminal legal system um, to uplift folks and to allow them to build power and sort of act in their own interests in a way that government has never allowed for, um, as well as ensuring that while we have, you know, quantitative data to make data-driven decisions that you know, sometimes the numbers really camouflage the messiness um, that is a, you know, in systems change. And then the third is just working towards um, moving outside of the criminal legal system um, to support other systems. And with that, um, I want to thank you all so, so much um, for your time. And I believe I have my contact information on the next slide. So thank you, Lisa, and all for being, allowing me to share this space with you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you for representing NOLA so well. Um, performance metrics are key, right? And NOLA has shown this and that they've shown that they've used them to allow their city council, um, their ethnic and racial disparities working group, their criminal justice council, um, all the entities that give out funding, to steering their resources to the providers in the system who are providing successful case management um, models to further the consistency of their reduction of disparities within the local jail. Um, NOLA is a perfect example of how a data-driven system really can um, enact change and that it's important to understand the um, importance of data and making sure that you use it appropriately. So thank you so much. Next, we're gonna hear from Mecklen Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, Chris um, Peters is going to um, round us out and close us out. He is a licensed clinical mental health clinician with experience working with children, adolescents, families, and adults 
um, around a variety of clinical and non-clinical issues. He has worked as a mental health clinician with the Mecklenburg Sheriff's Office, and uh, he currently works to divert individuals with mental health conditions from incarceration through pretrial diversion. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking your time to share about what Mecklenburg County is doing. Hey, thanks, Lisa. And I wanted to thank PRI and the MacArthur Foundation for um, having me and having let me speak. Um, uh, this is very important to me, what we do. Um, so yeah, I'm Chris Peters. I'm here at Mecklenburg County in Charlotte. Um, and I can just give you guys some insight. Um, next slide. So what I do, I work with pretrial here um, and the and a forensic evaluations unit. So I'm going to go give a little bit of a background. A lot of my peers have given a lot of data around surrounding um, incarceration, I think, which is very important. Um, but I think I have a unique position in the fact that I used to work within the detention facility as a clinician. Um, and now my role is a, actually an evolution of that original position. Um, so about I want to go, God, about six or seven years ago, I was a clinician within um, Mecklenburg County Detention Center, um, working with individuals who were incarcerated. Um, and just and, and at the time, what we were seeing was that there were a lot of individuals who were coming from minority populations um, who had underdiagnosed condition, mental health conditions or, or not diagnosed at all. Um, and the first time they were seeking treatment was within the detention center itself. Um, and so back then, I was remembering, thinking to myself, it would be great to prevent some of these um, individuals for in, in coming into the criminal justice system to begin with. Um, and pretrial pre here in Mecklenburg County was just starting out. Um, I actually remember when uh, Mecklenburg County got the MacArthur Grant. That's, and I remember thinking like, oh, that'd be a great idea. Like, uh, that'd be great to see how that gets implemented. Not thinking, um, here we are seven years later, I'm now a part of this whole initiative. So pre-trial and mental health um, is, rel is relatively new. My position has only been around for six months, but we've had mental health diversion um, for quite a long period of time. I think the diversion unit is about seven or eight years old at this point. Um, so they were generally dealing with a lot of the SPMI, the persistently mentally ill population. Um, a lot of individuals who are homeless and things like that. Um, and they saw that we needed a more specialized position, particularly for pretrial, just to the, due to the numbers of individuals that we were encountering who had mental health disorders and the ability to get them out of incarceration and to uh, monitor them within the community safely um, was important. Um, so that was kind of my first slide, the problem. Um, too often, you know, jail stays are, are dependent upon the ability to pay. Um, and so in Mecklenburg County, we saw two main drivers uh, to our local jail population, the length of stay and the, and the individuals held in custody pretrial. Um, the average uh, pretrial jail population alone was 64% of the total daily population back in 2021. Um, Despite making up approximately 33% of the local population, Black Americans and Hispanics um, make up 68% of the jail population as of 2019 um, in Mecklenburg County. And I've been told that that number has still been pretty consistent. Um, so we started to, like I said, started to get this position to start to do this better. Um, to actually work with individuals while they are detained or when they first become detained and to take them through that process of, oh, you're now incarcerated, now you're out on pretrial, how do we get you into services? How do we keep you into services? And you know, follow up with that. So I will give a good example. I had one individual who I met with yesterday who I've known for years, who has, um, he's persistently mentally ill. Um, but because we had that relationship, I was able to meet with him. We've been diverting him from the jail setting now for, a, I think, about a year or so, which has been great. Because um, I remember seeing this particular individual within the jail setting, oh my God, for months and months at a time. And um, when you see individuals who have um, mental illness within the detention center, usually, you know, we see them, as we know from the numbers, um, within isolation. Um, and they decompensate rapidly. And it is a terrible thing to want to see, but then I can only imagine being, you know, the individual experiencing that and knowing that there's not a way out. Um, so this particular individual, when I saw him yesterday, he was like, oh no, Chris, 
I'm going to be in jail again. And I was like, no, you know, we, you know, it's not like it was a couple of years ago. We have these things in place. I promise you, you know, if you work with us, we will be able to get you out. He was incarcerated on some minor charges um, and, you know, continue your, 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 pretty much he was doing well in the community, continue your well-being, your treatment in the community. And so we were able to get him out today. Um, and he, he was like, well, thank you. You know, things are good. You know, we'll, we'll I'll just follow back up and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's been good to say that um, just for me personally, knowing where Mecklenburg County was um, six or seven years ago and where we are now, I, I, this is something that I can only imagine. Um, so I'm very ex excited about what the MacArthur Foundation has done by coming into Mecklenburg County and assisting us and now being able to be a part of it. Um, so next slide. So out of that, we also started the implicit bias training. Um, this has been really exciting. So in the summer of 2020, um, the CJS launched a comprehensive and implicit bias training for criminal justice professionals. And it just examines the unconscious and implicit bias through an, an um, that can affect an individual's thought process and decision making in both subtle and, out, and overt ways. Um, so participants that have that have participated, <laughs> participants that have participated, I got caught up in my own words there, uh, has been the district attorney's office, public defender's office, judges, magistrates, community corrections, um, sheriff's office, and, the, and of course, criminal justice services at large. Um, so approximately 1,600 criminal justice professionals have taken the training so far. Um, and the training is publicly available on our CGS website, um, which is part of this presentation. And um, then the training files available to shared with interested partners. Um, so most recently, I think the Johnson County, yeah, Johnson County in Kansas, um, Department of Corrections, we're learning about, they learned about the training and requested a copy of our files. And we entered into an agreement with them to share um, our training. And as of June, 2021, they have had over 260 staff complete the implicit bias training. This is a very comprehensive training. Um, it's required, I think, for all um, Mecklenburg County employees as well. It's been very, very, um, very, very insightful. And it's been giving, it's gotten a lot of feedback, positive feedback from our, um, from everybody. So next slide. The community engagement task group was something that we also started back in 2021 as part of the MacArthur, or Mecklenburg County Safety and Justice ch um, Challenge. The criminal justice community engagement task group serves as a liaison between the community um, and criminal justice systems to help build trust and transparency. The task group is composed of 10 members from the community of diverse backgrounds, members of the faith community, individuals with lived experience from the criminal justice system are encouraged to apply and they have applied. Um, so it is facilitated by the criminal justice service um, equity and inclusion consultants with technical assistance from um, the W. Hayward Burns Institute. In addition, the public defender and um, chief deputy sheriff sit on the, in on the group in order to build trust and engagement between the local justice system partners in our community. Um, and the community members are compensated for their time and participation in the meeting, which I think is something that you know a lot of community groups like this aren't aren't really doing. Um, and our last slide, or next slide, um, which is our last slide, <laughs> is the equity or equity action plan. So Mecklenburg County government um, has formulated an equity action plan to advance you know equity goals throughout the county. Criminal justice services work is mostly aligned with. Um, I think it's the second goal that we have. I think it's like a six, no, it's the sixth goal. Um, is it second or sixth goal? I can't remember. I have to check. Uh, no, sixth goal. It is the sixth goal. We have six um, goals. Um, and we, and so this, the goal that we are mostly aligned with is all residents of Mecklenburg County to live in a more just and equitable community. Um, so a few of the department sub goals from that is that, you know, we're creating and implementing the racial equity toolkit to assess progress within CGS and to ensure equity is at the root and forefront of our decision making. Um, we collaborate with criminal justice state system stakeholders to review data and identify and quantify the impact of racially informed and inequitable outcomes at a criminal justice system decision points. And we work with the Criminal Justice Prevention Council along with um, the Criminal Justice Advisory Group and other criminal justice partner agencies within our community to identify additional areas um, of engagement Related specifically to issue to the issues of racial equality, um, so it's long story short, it's been woven into what our goals are as a county, 
um, as of the last calendar year. It's not just something that we are stating. Um, it is something that we are actively engaging in and working on. Um, and it's been very, very rewarding to be, you know, in Mecklenburg County at this time. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing about what's going on with Mecklenburg County. You know, as you um, kind of give um, your perspective of seeing what folks were trying to accomplish and then now it is accomplished and not only accomplished, you're sitting in that seat is just a testament, right? To the fact that when people um, have ideas and vision and implement them and surround themselves with not only the people who can get, um, uh, strategies accomplished and funded, it, it just works for the best for everyone. And it just shows you that the folks who um, put forth the effort, their diligence and fervency paid off. And the people who are receiving the services are the ones who are really um, benefiting from it. So congratulations, and we hope uh, continued success in, in Mecklenburg's endeavors and ability to reduce some of those gaps. We are at the end of our program. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I particularly want to thank our presenters this afternoon as well. Um, thank you, Bria. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Chris, for sharing um, your perspective on what's going on in uh, the, the Safety and Justice Challenge Network and at your specific jurisdictions and how you've been able to address um, the racial um, inequities that are happening in your system and being able to help folks rec not only recognize and acknowledge, but do something about it. Again, this is a three-part series that Policy Research Associates is hosting. Um, if you have the opportunity to tune in to our remaining two webinars, I'm certain that you will receive just as much um, interesting information and be pleased with the presenters that our SMVF colleagues are putting forward in addition to SOAR. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you again, presenters. And I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and afternoon. If there are any questions, feel free to email us um, or as we had stated that this webinar is being recorded and we'll be able to share it with those who have registered and attended. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.